Hello there, West Harasaki here. Today we are completing our study of the first chapter of the Gospel of John. We've looked at John's prologue, and now starting with verse 19, we enter a long narrative of the life of Christ that takes us through to the end of the book. Our passage today depicts some momentous days at the beginning of Christ's ministry. John the Baptist takes the spotlight off of himself and puts it on Jesus. This is followed by the story of how five men became the first followers of Jesus, an unnamed person who is presumably the author himself, and four others. We run into many important names in this passage, so much so that the context and significance of the story can be told by identifying these people. John the Baptist, Elijah and the prophet, Andrew, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel. And we learn much of the meaning of our passage by understanding two other names or titles, Christ and Lamb of God. These then will be the focus of our video today. First, there is John the Baptist. If you have studied any of the other Gospels, you know something about this man. John was born of a priestly family with both parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth, descendants of Aaron. Even before his birth, it was predicted that he would precede the Lord and make people ready for his coming. John was called the baptizer because he was baptizing people as a sign of repentance, turning away from sin, and turning back to God. He quickly develops a lot of notoriety and popularity. People flock to him and believe his message of repentance for sin. Although John came before Christ, he makes it clear that Jesus is first and foremost. In ancient rabbinic teacher-student relationships, the pupils did nearly everything to serve their masters, but removing a master's sandals was a menial task befitting a slave only. John humbly recognizes the supremacy of Christ. Compared to Jesus, he is not even worthy to untie Christ's sandals. The book of John does not directly mention the baptism of Jesus, which must have happened earlier. Rather, the gospel chooses to bring attention to the most important aspect of it. John says, The one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. The Holy Spirit visibly came like a dove, alighting on and remaining with Jesus. For John the Baptist, this was the defining moment that revealed to him Jesus as the Messiah, or Chosen One, who will baptize through the Holy Spirit. That the Spirit rested and remained on Jesus is revealing. As Isaiah had said, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. John's baptism indicated recognition of sin and repentance. Christ's baptism indicated life change and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within the believer. Thus, John's baptism was a preparation for a greater event that would arrive with Jesus. There was a widespread Jewish notion that the coming of the Messiah would be preceded by the coming back of Elijah. It was believed that the Old Testament prophet Elijah never died. In 2 Kings, he was taken to heaven by a chariot of fire, and many expected him to reappear someday. Recall that the last prophet of the Old Testament, Malachi, had closed with this promise. I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. John the Baptist looked the part. He came from the desert wearing camel's hair clothes with a leather belt around his waist, just like Elijah. But John is not willing to be identified with him, even though he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And clearly his calling was to clear the path for Jesus' arrival. There was a sense in which John was Elijah and a sense in which he was not. He fulfilled all the preliminary ministry that Malachi had foretold, and thus, in a very real sense, 
Jesus could say that he was Elijah. Another expectation comes from Moses, who promised, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. Many Jews pictured the coming Messiah as prophet as well as priest and king. Is it not significant that at Jesus' transfiguration, where both Moses and Elijah were present, the voice of the Father said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. The Apostle Peter at Pentecost makes it explicit. Moses' promise is fulfilled not in John the Baptist, but in Jesus. Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. If John is not Elijah or the prophet, who is he? How shocking it must have been for this rugged mountain man who eats honey and locusts to quote Isaiah 40 to describe himself. John is the voice in the wilderness who clears the way for the Messiah to travel into the hearts and lives of his people. Andrew is the first of Christ's disciples we meet in the Bible. He is Peter's brother, and they share a home in Capernaum on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, along with Peter's wife and mother-in-law. Andrew was originally a fisherman, and he and Peter probably worked in partnership with the sons of Zebedee. Like John, he first followed John the Baptist, but they quickly recognized the validity of Jesus' ministry. Perhaps the most notable thing about Andrew is what we see him doing in this chapter, bringing Peter to Christ. We've come to know Peter as the once brash and impetuous leader of the Twelve Disciples. At first he is Simon, and we can't be certain as to why Jesus names him Peter, which means rock in Greek. Certainly, he became a pillar of the early Christian church and showed strength and fortitude against opposition and persecution in the years after Christ's death. But prior to that, he was anything but rock solid when he denied Christ three times, and on the Sea of Galilee, he sank like a stone. In later years, he develops a ministry among Greek Gentiles, and it makes sense that he would become known by his Greek name, Peter. So it's either his eventual change in character or change in ministry that Jesus might be foretelling. The focus is much less on what this name change means for Peter than on the Jesus who knows people thoroughly and not only sees into them, but makes them what he calls them to be. It is striking how regularly Jesus approached people from the perspective of their potential. Philip, who was from Bethsaida, goes and gets Nathanael, who is from Cana, and brings him to Christ. Now Philip is not the Philip that we read about in Acts, the one that evangelized the Ethiopian official on the Gaza road and eventually had a long ministry in Caesarea. That Philip was one of the seven chosen to serve the Greek widows in Acts 6. Our Philip was apparently one of the twelve disciples. He was Jewish but likely spoke Greek in addition to Aramaic. Thus, Greeks enlisted his help when they wanted to meet Jesus. We last hear of him in Acts chapter 1, waiting for the Holy Spirit in the upper room at Pentecost. Tradition has it that he eventually lived in Asia and was martyred in Hierapolis, one of the cities near Colossae and Ephesus. One of the most discussed topics about Nathaniel is the question of his identity, you see, Nathaniel is never mentioned in the Synoptic Gospels as one of the Twelve, though it seems like he must be. Many people believe that his other name is Bartholomew, and he is named in the Synoptics but never named in John. There are reasons for suspecting that Nathaniel and Bartholomew are the same person. In the Synoptics, Bartholomew is consistently coupled with Philip, and Bartholomew is not really a personal name but means son of Ptolemy. Thus, he would certainly have had another name. Regardless, Nathaniel's conversation with Jesus is remarkable for a number of reasons. 
Let's look at the encounter. Philip, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. Nathanael, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Philip, come and see. Jesus, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael, how do you know me? Jesus, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Why is Nathanael so doubtful that Messiah would come from Nazareth? Well, perhaps he feels that Nazareth is too rural or insignificant to be Messiah's birthplace, or that the scriptures indicate that he will come from Bethlehem. He is equally skeptical about Jesus until the Lord identifies him as an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Why does Jesus call him an Israelite? After the Babylonian exile, the people were known as Jews, not Israelites. And why does Jesus pointedly say Nathanael has no deceit? Both of Jesus' comments likely refer back to the patriarch of Israel, Jacob, known for his deceit against his brother Esau. In essence, Jesus is saying that Nathanael is not like Jacob, but rather he is what an Israelite should have been. Astonished, Nathanael discovers that Jesus even knows that he had been under a fig tree. What he was doing there is not known, but some think this expression means studying scripture. Perhaps Nathanael even received a word from God at that time. Nathanael is so struck and moved by this revelation that he immediately declares Christ's scriptural authority, rabbi, divinity, son of God, and sovereignty, king of Israel. No one could be all these things if not the Messiah. Nathanael becomes a believer and follower of Jesus on the spot. At the end of the narrative in verse 51, Jesus makes his promise not only to Nathanael, but to everyone. Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The image here is that of Jacob's ladder or stairway in Genesis 28. Now don't get caught up in the idea that Christians climb the ladder, as some hymns have said or whether there is a continuous stream of incoming and outgoing angels. Rather, the point of the vision is the connection between heaven and earth, now made real in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the stairway. Christ is the Greek form of the word for Messiah. It is the title we give to Jesus, as in Jesus the Christ. And it follows his name so often that we've essentially made Jesus Christ a single proper name. For us today, it's not difficult to know who the Christ is. But the word Messiah seems more elusive. When you read the New Testament, you get the impression that everyone knew what Messiah meant. John the Baptist assumed the Jewish leaders knew what he was talking about when he said he is not the Messiah. Andrew told Peter, we have found the Messiah. No definition or explanation was given. However, exactly who and what the Messiah would be was anything but clear to the ancient Jews. They inferred from scripture that a great person of some kind would one day come and reestablish Israel. This figure would in some way restore the nation to worldwide prominence. Many looked at him as a coming king who would be a descendant of King David and would rule with military power. Others looked for a supreme priest-like figure who would rule in righteousness or a great prophet like Moses. But perhaps the most detailed description of the Messiah comes from Isaiah, and few people noticed it. He would be a suffering servant. A suffering servant and a Lamb of God. For many Christians today, the expression Lamb of God needs no explanation. We are grateful that Jesus was the sacrificial lamb that took away our sin by dying in our place. But for the people in John's story, the expression might have been surprising or confusing or even shocking. The crucifixion had not yet occurred 
and no one is thinking God himself would be that lamb. John is the only person in the Bible who describes Christ as the Lamb of God. For Jesus to carry away our sin is an absolute necessity if we are to live in the presence of God. So, today we study a passage full of memorable figures who become alive to us in the pages of the Bible. They step out of history, discover who Christ is, and respond. John the Baptist, Andrew, Peter, Philip, Nathaniel. What they find, and we can find too, is Jesus, the Messiah, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world.